Uh, we've begun recording it. So again, I'm uh, privileged to welcome everyone to the first GUPS virtual education series event. Uh, my name is Samson Fine. I have the privilege of serving as the GUPS education committee chair. Uh, your education committee is hard at work planning USCAP and virtual education events uh, for 2022. So please stay tuned for more information coming your way in the near future. Um, without further ado, we'll introduce the program. I'm going to share my screen for a moment. Uh, today, we have genitourinary urinary pathology, WHO updates, the latest on renal, urothelial, and testicular tumors with an outstanding panel. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing, and you can see Dr. Andre Hess in the top uh, left uh, screen, Dr. Eva Kamparat, and Dr. Daniel Burney. Um, we are, they, both, all three of them are outstanding GU pathology colleagues and speakers, um, and we're going to go in the order that I mentioned them. And so we're going to begin with Dr. Hess. Dr. Hess is a professor of pathology and holds the title of Head of Laboratory of Special Diagnostics in the Department of Pathology at Charles University Hospital in Pilsen in the Czech Republic. Uh, he's been involved in all of the major efforts in GU pathology over the past decade, notably in the realm of kidney tumors, including for the last and anticipated upcoming WHO Blue Books. He is the responsible author and or co-author of 10 WHO chapters on renal neoplasia, and without further ado, Andre, please share your screen and we're ready to begin. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, okay, thank you very much for invitation uh, and thank you very much uh, for, the, for the possibility to, to share my experience with the new WHO. Uh, hopefully all can see my I am very sorry for that. How are we? Okay. So uh, my task is uh, to comment the new developments on the renal pathology in the new WHO. Uh, I have no conflict of interest, and I am pretty sure that everybody is familiar with the old WHO born in 2016. And of course, we can expect the new entities or new approaches to another uh, or known uh, kidney tumors. Uh, uh, this is the screen showing the uh, approximate WHO22 renal tumors panel. And I am going to comment just the news uh, in, in this classification as is highlighted in the red. So let me start with the first entity, which is papillary renal cell carcinoma. Uh, I think that everybody is uh, very familiar with the old or traditional classic uh, uh, classification of the papillary renal cell carcinomas for type 1 and type 2. However, we discussed this topic more than for 10, 15 years, and uh, we all know that uh, the new development and new information will, will dramatically change the, this approach for just one, and what, what, for type 1 and for type 2 uh, papillary renal cell carcinomas. So during the years, there is, a, uh, uh, there is evidence uh, of the different variants, different growth patterns, different architecture. Let me start with this one, which is solid papillary renal cell carcinoma, or we can have a papillary renal cell carcinoma composed of clear or foam cells. We can have a papillary renal cell carcinoma with squamoid cells, with empiripolesis, with mucin production, Vartin-like uh, reverse polarity. Uh, so, uh, if we take all information together, we see pretty uh, pretty complicated uh, pattern of the of the papillary renal cell carcinomas. So we have approximately shared morphology with the tubular papillary pattern. Uh, all you know that immunohistochemistry not, is not constant. We have uh, some uh, constant uh, immunohistochemical markers like Amaker, CT7, Vimentin, but we all know that it's not enough. So we have a pretty variable landscape of the papillary renal cell carcinomas with overlapping. And what is important that we have are the entities which are standing out of the papillary renal cell carcinoma group. So for the new WHO, the, the uh, concept of the papillary renal cell carcinoma is much more broader. All those variants or sub-entities are uh, are, are connected and lump it in together to together to the papillary renal cell carcinoma uh, family or group or, or or company. What is very important is to rule out the others. So uh, 
if we have other unusual papillary renal cell carcinomas, we have to uh, focus on the ruling out the ALK or the translocation carcinoma or FH carcinoma, uh, which were originally many, many years ago before the, all these genetic uh, advantage, advances uh, in, in included into the papillary renal cell carcinoma group. Another group where the changes were coming is a uh, so call it other oncocytic tumors. All of us are familiar with renal oncocytoma. All of us are, all of us are familiar with chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. We, but we all know who are who doing the geopathology that sometimes we have the tumors with overlapping features. And it's very difficult to say if it's oncocytoma or chromophobe. In the previous WHO, we used the chromophobe unusual or, 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 or provisional chromophobe family or chromophobe subtype uh, for those tumors. Now, in new WHO, we know that we have a so-called hybrid tumors, but if you say hybrid now, it should be reserved for the syndromic tumors in BHD syndrome. And then we have the sporadic, and sporadics, there are the groups of the tumors we, who share just the solid or mostly solid architecture in the oncocytic cells. Among those, uh, among those tumors, there are two uh, subvariants or sub-entities or entities which are relatively very distinct. One is composed of very compact uh, cell population. You see the sharp border. Uh, they are very pink. And usually in the center, you can find edema or hemorrhagia or both. Those tumors are composed of nice oncocytic cells. They have a very round nucleoli with slight perinuclear clearing. What is very characteristic is a immunohistochemical profile with CT7 diffuse positivity and CD117 negativity. Those tumors are called low-grade oncocytic tumors, LOT, LOT, and they are considered to be emerging entities. And among those tumors, there is another one, also compact, less pink. It's a, a more loose in architecture. Uh, they are very different in the cytologic level. You see the compact cells with the basal membrane surrounding those isolates of the cells and nuclei are pretty high grade. They look at, at least as a grade three uh, using the WHO or ISA modification. These tumors are so-called eosinophilic vacuolated tumors, EVT. What they have in common, they share the non-aggressive clinical cores and both are associated with mTOR pathway gene abnormalities. So let's move a little bit further to clear cell papillary uh, renal cell carcinoma. Now we will say clear cell papillary tumor. Uh, I think we all are familiar with the morphology. You see the shark smiles, you see the, you see the snouts, the nuclei attenuated from the basal membrane and sometimes very prominent stroma. Very important is a immunohistochemical profile with diffuse CT7 positivity and carbohydrate 9 positivity. What is important that in those tumors which are not perfect, we are not able to find any VHL gene abnormalities, including methylation, LOH, 3P, and mutation. So obviously, clear cell papillary renal cell carcinoma is a tumor with minimal aggressive potential. That's the reason why the new name uh, uh, where we changed the RCC for the tumor uh, was, was created. Of course, we have uh, some case reports where descri which describing the uh, aggressive behavior. Uh, however, at least in this one, I had a chance to, to analyze this and we found a mutation. So uh, we can conclude that the aggressive behavior in clear cell papillary renal cell tumor, as, as it, will be, it will be named now, uh, is a minimal, minimal and those tumors are harmless. The new, new guy in the, in the WHO classification is a ESC, eosinophilic solid and cystic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, I think that the name is uh, very well following the, the architecture. You see the solid and cystic areas. Uh, tumors are mostly sporadic, and in the, those sporadics, the females are the predominant sex, and usually you will find them in the older patients. The size is pretty variable. What is important that usually there is a no aggressive behavior. However, there are uh, increasing number of the, of the case reports or short series showing the metastatic cases. So there is a, some possibility of the metastatic behavior. Uh, they are relatively high grade using the ISOP WHO. And what is important that they are also associated with tuberosclerosis. Uh, so you can find the identical tumors in tuberosclerosis. Usually those tumors, they have uh, the solid areas composed of very very eosinophilic, not oncocytic, but eosinophilic cells. And you can find the cystic areas, which are usually filled by the eosinophilic fluid. 
Uh, if you go a little bit higher in magnification, you can appreciate the stippling, the cytoplasmic stippling. Sometimes we call that it looks like Leishmanias. It has nothing to do with Leishmania, but it's just the nickname. And usually people uh, remember those cases according to strange nicknames. So this is very characteristic, but not specific for the ESC. Uh, very nice uh, marker is CT20. In majority of the cases, you can find a CT20 positivity. Could be patchy, could be diffuse, but usually my experience that you will find something like in oncocytoma with CT7. So just very strong, but single cells positive. Uh, so this is the immunohistochemical chemical and molecular genetic pattern. What I would like to depict, there are abnormalities in mTOR pathway genes. So if you test them, you will find usual mutations in TSC1, TSC2, or mTOR. We have a, we have a very huge group of the molecularly defined renal cell carcinoma. And of course, the TFE3 rearranged RCC of TFE3 translocation carcinoma is the number one. Uh, we are all uh, familiar with the cases which are tubular papillary, as you can see in this picture, and they are usually composed of uh, clear to eosinophilic cells. Sometimes we can have a combination like this one. I think everybody would anticipate the, the TFE3 possible differential diagnosis. But with the increased knowledge about those tumors, we have a tumors which are completely eosinophilic and mostly solid. We can have a tumors which looks like TFEB or, or, or angiomalipoma or strange pecomas. Uh, in all the partners uh, for TFE3 makes the matter. They, they, they change the pattern, they change the architecture. And it's very important to count with the different patterns with the different partners. So what we can do for those tumors, we can stain with TFE3. The results are sometimes good, sometimes not. Occasionally, we can use the melanotic markers and catepsin K, which is positive in most of the cases. Uh, the CT uh, profile, the cytokeratin profile is usually variable, even could be negative. Important is that we can support our diagnosis by FISH. But if FISH is negative, it doesn't mean that those tumors are not translocation. In those strange partners, we have to go for the NGS because FISH is out of the, of the scope of the, the, the probe is usually not good enough to make diagnosis. Uh, TFEB rearrange RCC. This is another tumor which we know for years. And the basic classic pattern is basically HMD diagnosis. We can support ourselves with the HMB45 or melan-A, but the basic pattern is very well known. But similarly, like in TFE3, uh, we have a more and more patterns, which looks like Pecoma, uh, HMB45 doesn't, doesn't, doesn't help too much. Uh, they can look very strangely like some strange papillary renal cell carcinoma. They can even look like the TFE3 or, or uh, clear cell papillary renal cell tumor, as you can see in this case. So uh, an HMB in such cases could be really, they say sometimes wishy-washy, you don't know, it's mostly negative. So usually if you use the melanotic markers and if they are negative, I always go for FISH or NGS. And NGS is important because you can have a, a, a TFEB a tumor with abnormal gene situation. And if you do not use the NGS or if you do not count the copy, copy, variation, copy number variation pattern or, or uh, other, you can easily miss the TFEB amplification RCCs, which are aggressive and which can be, which can be malignant. Uh, another entity, another new entity in WHO is a renal cell carcinoma with fibromyomatous stroma. This is not the name in the WHO. This is just very common situation. You have a tumor which is composed of clear cells. There is a huge stroma and those tumors are CT7 positive. They can look like this one or they can be very different. But again, you have the clear cells, you have the stroma and CT7 is positive as you can see here. So what we can do for those tumors? I think there is the only way how to uh, recognize those tumors. And this way is the genetic analysis. We have to test the mTOR pathway genes. We have to test the ELOC and we have to test the VHL status because we can, have a, we can get a different results. We can have a VHL mutated or abnormal tumor. And this is the clear cell renal cell carcinoma just with the stroma. And those tumors can be aggressive. They can metastasize. Or we can get an ELOC ELOC or TCEB mutated renal cell carcinoma, which is the now WHO entity. Uh, very similar and very close is the tumor with the mTOR pathway gene uh, mutation, or we can get something else. So my last, uh, last uh, tumor, which I want to share with you, is a tumor which is very rare in Europe. Uh, I know that in US uh, you, have a, the, you have the more cases. 
I, I, personally, I do not have my own case. I do not have a single case. So I ask my friend uh, uh, Abbas Agaimi to share his, his, his photos. So we can have a the renal, renal medullary carcinoma with Mark B1 deficiency. Uh, those tumors are always high-grade infiltrative adenocarcinomas, and they are located in the uh, medulla or very close to the renal pelvis. So, unfortunately, sometimes we are not able to get the uh, to to get the, uh, get the, this impression just uh, from the grossing because the tumor is too large, and we are not able to uh, to correctly locate the tumor. So in a case that we have a tumor of similar uh, architecture and cytology, we have to go for the uh, at least basic uh, molecular, molecular uh, analysis. Thank you very much for your attention and I am ready to take the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hess, uh, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Um, reminding all participants that you can put your questions uh, in Q&A. We have a couple of minutes, and so we'll get started with the following question. Um, how, uh, one participant asked, how often you see uh, melan A expression in eosinophilic solid and cystic RCC? Uh, uh, actually, I have just one case. Uh, I've got this case from the South Africa as a, as a consult, and we already published this, this case. So just one single case among my couple of tens of the cases. I think it's very rare. Great. Um, question from a colleague. Uh, thank you for thanking you for the excellent overview and asking, does this uh, does anything change in the grading of these tumors? Meaning, are you routinely grading these tumors, uh, you know, uh, using the WHO ISAP classification uh, or the like? Uh, it's, it's a very difficult question. I think it's a really question for one hour discussion, but uh, I always follow the WHO ISOP modification for the clear cell for the papillary renal cell carcinoma. We do not use it for the, for the chromophobe and stuff. We do not use it for the oncocytic stuff, but because our law system, we have to, we, we are obliged to, to send a report to the national registry. So we use so-called formal grading, but it's Always, I always I, I put the notice that it doesn't mean anything for the for the clinical behavior or for the management of the patient. So we always for those strange cases or cases which are not clear cell papillary, we always make some notice that it's just formal grading. Great, uh, thank you so much. Uh, a number of the uh, participants wanted to know in the spectrum of these uh, of, of these tumors that you described. You mentioned a couple of them, uh, you know, uh, TFE three partners and the, and the like. How often uh, do you uh, sort of routinely or more reflex go towards next generation sequencing in these uh, uh, more uh, unusual uh, variants? Yeah, I, I think my practice is a little bit biased because I got a lot of consult cases. So for the consult cases, as used pretty routinely. Uh, we have an indoor approximately 200, 250 cases a year. So to be honest, I think for the routine stuff, because we have the same, uh, same cases, same types of the tumors like everywhere, 70% are clear cell renal cell carcinomas. So I think let's say a couple of tens a year from the routine indoor cases, but it's completely different for the, for the second opinion practice. So uh, it's, it's pretty common for the second opinion. Okay. Um, the uh, high-grade oncocytic tumors, uh, eosinophilic uh, uh, solid and cystic RCC uh, associated with TSC and the mTOR mutations, are these, are, are these now all to be thought of as grouped as molecularly defined RCC? I don't think so. I think really, you know, this is evol evolving. I, of course, I advocate those entities because they are my babies. I like them because we, we made a lot of work about them. But, you know, on the other hand, we have to be realistic. So uh, I don't like to anticipate the, the development for the next five years. But nowadays, 2022, I would like to say that majority, vast majority of those cases, you can, you can diagnose, diagnose, make the diagnosis just with H and D and two, three immunos. It's, it's easy enough. But, but, you know, we will get the overlapping cases very soon. We will get the strange cases, cases associated with something else. So I think that we have to go deeply. But so far at the 2022, I think mostly we can do the diagnosis using H and D, good sampling and two, three immunos. Excellent. Thank you. And with that, since we're hitting, uh, you know, uh, about a, a third of the way through the hour, and we want to leave some time for each uh, talk to have questions. We want to thank you so much, Andra, for the uh, excellent right. overview. Um, I'm now going to have the 
privilege of introducing Professor Ava Kamparat. Uh, Ava is currently Professor of Pathology at Vienna Medical University after training in Paris and rising to full professor at the Sorbonne. Um, Ava is a consulting pathologist for European guidelines in bladder cancer and plays a similar role for the European Society of Medical Oncology. She is co-chair of the updated uh, International Consortium for Cancer Reporting Bladder Section and like our last speaker, uh, who we'll hear about, served as an editor for the fifth edition WHO classification focused on urothelial neoplasia, amongst other things. Uh, please, Ava, share your screen and uh, we can get going. Uh, reminder to uh, continue to put your questions in the Q&A uh, portion of the Zoom. So uh, I'm sorry, I think you will see the, the small slides on the side. So I'm, I really apologize about this one. I will try to make it a little bit bigger. So yeah, what's new? What's new in, in bladder? But well, actually not very much. I would say the best thing is that histological characteristics remain the gold standard for the classification and diagnosis for urothelial tract tumors. So we remain the gold standard. We are the best and there's nothing really has changed, I would say. So the classification issues in, in bladder were that we really wanted to focus on the lineages of differentiation and um, so we have in the fifth edition really always a very good description from benign to malignant and something else we will see a little bit later is that the chapters are split by tumor lineages of differentiation so I think this is really something which should kept, be kept in mind so you can have tumors which have a similar morphology but they are described in different chapters because they're not the same lineage specific issues well we have this time no specific chapters for urothelial tract upper urinary tract tumors for the urethra and for the prostate where there's urothelium because uh, it's already discussed in the urothelial part and they're all the information you need in the urothelial part so we didn't want to make things double we have new denominations, and this is something which is really very important for all the chapters because uh, we will really, there's a kind of impact of molecular, which is getting more and more important, and especially on the prognostication. And there will be, of course, selections of treatments of different approaches between who will be given new adjuvant, adjuvant, and so on in the future. So we left variant to the molecular guys, and we will update our nomenclature and say subtypes for histology like microcystic, nested. Uh, sarcomatoid, whatever. And this is really something which you will find in all the chapters, not only in the bladder. And variant is really something which will, which will be used commonly by uh, genomic alterations. And so we can really make a good difference between surgical pathology and molecular pathology. Something which is also very important, every chapter has the same structure. And I really would like to insist a little bit on that because we have some really very important issues on that, especially I like very much the essential and desirable diagnostic criteria where you really see with one eye, uh, especially quickly, uh, whether uh, there is something really very important to recognize in this or this uh, entity. So I think this is really something which is very important. Um, so the classification system in urothelial lesions, yeah, we have these six major chapters. Of course, the most important is the urothelial tumor chapters, which afterwards followed by squamous, then the glandular, uracal and diverticular, urethral, and the tumors of the mullerian type, which have to be recognized, although they're pretty rare. So in the urothelial tumors, we have two entities, which are benign entities, which are the papilloma, as you can see above, with these kind of uh, tuft, um, uh, umbrella cells and we have the inverted papilloma of course which also is a benign lesion and then we have panlums which are these papillary low malignant potential lesions which are not invasive and all the other non-invasive papillary tumors like uh, carcinomas which are low grade and high grade as you know and then we have a specific part which is the carcinoma in situ and in the carcinoma in situ there is still dysplasia so dysplasia is, of course, something which has been hugely debated. Uh, everybody disagrees, and I think nobody agrees on this picture on the right, um, but it was the best I found. Uh, nevertheless, there is, of course, and everybody knows that there's a less lack of agreement, and it's not very reproducible. Um, there's one thing which is important that this pleasure is not a synonym of intraepithelial neoplasia. And if you look at the definition, well, it's a little bit 
tricky definition, I would say. We have a lesion that encompasses changes that are thought to be pre-neoplastic in nature, but cytologically fall short of the diagnosis of carcinoma in situ. And I think this shows pretty well that we are not very at ease with this kind of uh, dysplasia. So when we go a little bit further then to the classification system, then we have the squamous cell neoplasms, which, has, which also has been a little bit thinned. So we have the papilloma, and then we have the carcinoma with the verrucous carcinoma, which is really extremely rare, and the pure squamous cell carcinoma. So things have become much easier in this new classification. And then we have the glandular neoplasms with the adenoma, as you can see on the right which also are pretty, pretty rare, like this villus adenoma and then the adenocarcinomas, not otherwise specified. So once again, really, the classification has become pretty slim. Then in the uracle and diverticular neoplasms, we have still both uh, tumors. And I think it's very important, especially to, to be uh, aware that uracle carcinoma, you can not only do by histology, you also need the imaging, you need the clinical information, uh, which anyway should be given all the time. And then the urethral uh, neoplasms, we have three uh, chapters, which are pretty, pretty tricky, the literary gland carcinoma, the skin gland, and the copa gland carcinomas. And I just would like to insist that Ombra has, has pretty much worked on these chapters. And then we have the tumors of the Mullerian type, of course, the clear cell adenocarcinomas, and the endometrial carcinomas, which are extremely rare too. And then there's something which is very important too. We have some chapters which are completely differently distributed. So the neuroendocrine uh, is a chapter apart and we do not talk like in the other WHO uh, editions before about uh, you know ne neuroendocrine in the bladder, neuroendocrine in the pro prostate. We have put all these things together because we consider they look very much alike. They have the same immunoprofiles where there's one big chapter for uh, including the neuroendocrine tumors uh, and ETs for the carcinoids, and another part uh, is the paraganglioma, which are well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. We have to admit that we do not have an established grading system for all these tumors. Um, they say, well, we should do a little bit like in the GI tract, especially in the pancreas, so this should be kept in mind too. And then we have the very huge, important uh, chapter about neuroendocrine carcinomas, the small cell ones, the large ones, and the mixed ones. And I think the mixed ones are really very important to be kept in mind because they're pretty frequent, especially in the bladder, you can have up to 50% of mixed tumors. And and this is really a component of neuroendocrine, uh, synapto and chromo A positive and a non neuroendocrine component. And of course, you have to report them with percentages because it's a big difference if you have 10% or whether you have 90% of a neuroendocrine tumor, but it really should just show to the clinician uh, whether this is a big amount or not. And then other, uh, other chapters are differently distributed, like the mesenchymal uh, tumors, the hammer to lymphoid tumors, and also the hereditary tumors. So what about grading? Well, grading is always very tricky. Um, we have this kept this uh, three-tiered classification model, which we already had in 2004 and 2016, and even in ISOP 98, with the PANLAMS, the low grade, and the high grade. And this really reflects pretty well the carcinogenesis of urothelial carcinoma, and I think this is a very good thing to do. And then we have in low grade and high grade PTAs, the essential and desirable diagnostic criteria. So we have to have a fibrovascular core. Otherwise you cannot call it PTA. We have, if it's low grade, mild cytological atypia. And otherwise, if it's high grade, of course, you have significant cyt cyto and architectural disorder. Um, it is important to have a smooth stromal epithelial interface to show that there's no invasion. And in the high grade lesions, well, it's always, of course, you always give a diagnosis on the highest grade component. So, but if you call it just high grade without any other mention, you have to have more than 5%. And in these mixed tumors, we will talk about this within a few seconds. It's a little bit uh, tricky, but uh, not so complicated. So be aware, high grade, low grade, um, and be very, very careful if you have upper urinary tract disease, because here you can get it really wrong. Don't overgrade and don't overstage these lesions. So this is just to show you on the left side, you have this fibrovascular core, which is really mandatory to have PTA tumor. And on the right side, you can see this very smooth interface and there's no sign of invasion. 
On the left side, once again, fibrovascular core and a high grade lesion. On the right side, on the other hand, you can see this is a kind of pseudo papillary inflammatory cystitis. You don't have any fibrovascular core, you just have these kind of vessels which are dilated, and you see it's very inflammatory. Nothing to do with a PTA tumor. Inverted histologies are very important too. So they're graded, especially like um, the exophytic tumors with high grade, low grade panel lumps. Uh, exclusively inverted lesions are very rare. And when they're really dominant, you can, of course, include in your description inverted. Um, but most of the time, they're a little bit mixed. But if it's really very important, call it inverted. Here you can see the problems with these inverted lesions. Sometimes you have the problem, is this tangential cutting? Is it really inverted? These two lesions, in my opinion, were really inverted lesions. On the left side, a PTA low grade. And on the right side, also a PTA low grade in the urethra, which I have seen really pretty rarely. So grading of the invasive tumors, and we remember, contrary to the urologist's PT1 tumors are already invasive for us. So most of them are high grade, of course. Low grade is really extremely rare, and uh, we're not very much at ease with this low grade invasive urothelial carcinomas. Personally, I'm not a big fan of those. Uh, but the problem is we do not have any standardized criteria to designate an invasive urothelial carcinoma as low grade, and we don't really know very well how to do. One thing is sure that you will not have any, uh, any use with immunohistochemistry because this is not for uh, grading purposes. Um, on the other hand, it must be underlined, and I think this is really something very important, that all the histological subtypes of urothelial carcinoma and also those with divergent differentiation like the squamous, the trophoblastic and the adenocarcinomas are all considered high grade. Even the nested are considered high grade. So don't grade them because anyway, they're high grade. Um, concerning the tumor heterogeneity, well, it depends a little bit on the studies, but you can have from five to 40 percent uh, tumors which have mixed patterns. So we in the fifth edition have decided to take um, something which has already been done before in the in 2004 edition, for example, to call papillary tumors high grade when they have more than 5% of high grade. If it's less, of course, you should talk about it to your clinician, and then you can say it's a low grade tumor with less than 5% percent high grade component. I think it's a very pragmatic approach, but I think it's a very good approach. And uh, it's a little bit an ice ball estimation, but nevertheless, I think 5% um, is a very good cutoff. Big issue is the substaging, T1 substaging, of course. Uh, 2016 said, well, we should do it because it's very important for the recurrence and the stage progression, but they didn't tell us how to do. So 2022, we say, well, there are different uh, types of subcategorization, the micrometric, uh, the histoanatomic landmarks, and probably you can use do, do the one you feel the best, but we do not have any prospective head-to-head -head studies, big studies, prospective, where we can say, well, this method is better than the other, and be aware that you can have all types of problems with a hyperplastic, muscularis mucosa, lack of orientation, and so on. So be aware that the substaging is not always feasible, and if it's not feasible, just don't do it, just call it T1. So this is just to show you, um, that doesn't work, my animation, anyway, it's just to show you um, that if you don't have any lamina propria, of course, you cannot do any substaging. The nested variants, be very careful because they have this kind of pushing borders. If you have a hyperplasia of the muscularis mucosa, don't be a hero, just call it T1. A few words about molecular issues. Um, well, there's very much data. You all you all know this wonderful picture from the Camun paper where we have six different subgroups with uh, different genetic um, aspects, with different prognosis, and so on. Nevertheless, uh, the GAPS paper, the last GASP, GAPS paper, and it's not only GAPS, but also ESMO and EAU say that there's more data needed, that we currently do not re reach the threshold for a consistent application in routine pathology practice or for patient management. So really, I think we need a little bit more data. The classification also talks about urine cytology, and we should take the Paris system, which is a very important management tool. And one thing which is very important with the grading too, and which should not be forgotten, is that uh, the urine cytology Paris system, 
talks, especially about high grade lesions, talks very, very few about low grade lesions because they're very, very difficult in cytology. But nevertheless, the low grade and high grade in histology is very, very well superposable with the urine cytology. And then you find all these different entities between non diagnostic. I think that's a very important one because it shows very well that we are not able to say what it is. Uh, negative for the high grade, a typical suspicious high grade. The low grade is really very, very discussed entity and of course the secondaries. And last but not least, um, there is also um, a, a chapter about imaging because there are several techniques like CT of course, which are already well known, but there's also the multi-parametric MRI and the VRADs with the try and bladder to do a little bit the same like the PRADs in the prostate. Um, probably it could be helpful to in, in C staging, so clinical staging, and uh, very much is written about those things. So I think this is something which should be taken into consideration. If you want to have more information, please go and have a look at these two bladder papers, which have been published uh, in July 2021. One about um, how to grade, especially flat and papillary neoplasias, and the other one, how to do the substaging with T1 a little bit about variants. Uh, at the time we call, still called it variant histologies and not subtypes, and a little bit about the molecular uh, taxonomy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eva, for the excellent uh, summary. Um, we uh, A couple of uh, questions have already come in. Um, the first uh, is about the separation of bladder diverticular tumors. Um, and given that their morphology overlaps with uh, otherwise urothelial carcinoma and its subtypes, uh, why they were separated out? Very good question. Well, we wanted to make things like a little bit simpler this time. So that's that's uh, the major reason because um, one of the problems was that there were very many new entities which came in, especially paratesticular. So it stands, it stands fault actually. And we couldn't have more than 650 pages. And we wanted to have the same structure for everybody. So of course we had to slim down several chapters, but I mean, in, in diverticula and, and so on, it's a little bit the same uh, morphology as in normal urothelial. So it's not a major issue. The only thing is maybe very, you can see a little bit more often uh, things like, um, uh, sorry, I lost everybody. Um, things like squamous cell carcinomas. Understood. So we've had a couple questions about, not maybe not surprisingly, about this five percent cutoff uh, for high grade. Uh, you know, one person's four uh, percent, maybe another person's six uh, percent. Uh, any practical advice in that realm? Well, if you have these kind of heterogeneous tumors, uh, I would really uh, advise to to include the whole lesion, because if you see after five slides or ten slides that you have quite a mixed humor, well, you would like to know what is on the on the rest of, of the container. Um, the second thing, it's, it's extremely pragmatic, everybody agrees on that, but we only have very small studies. Uh, we have a very nice paper from Downs, which shows that even in the low grade um, setting, you have already molecular changes, which are very close to the high grade. So probably you should call all of those high grade, but uh, we, we will not go so far. So I think 5%, which was introduced in 2000 by Cheng, but Liang Cheng is a very pragmatic and very good way to do and, it, and it's pretty easy. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. next question that came in through the chat is, do you require at least two positive neuroendocrine markers to make a diagnosis of small cell or large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma? No, <laughs> no, it's morphology, which really counts. If I do not, first of all, if I do not think from a morphology point of view that it's neuroendocrine, I won't even do the markers. Uh, the second thing is very often in my experience, synaptom works much better than chromo A in the GU setting. So uh, of course I do both. And uh, normally one is better expressed than the other, or it can be that one is completely negative. Well, nevertheless, if I'm convinced from morphology, I, st I still do it, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> Understood. Uh, one more question uh, that uh, came in before, and I see some popping up right now, uh, is in regard to uh, something that might be missing in the fifth edition that was there in the fourth edition. Uh, how is U-Pump being handled? <laughs> but not at all. That's why you should read the GUPS paper. 
<laughs> because there are very many interesting approaches because you can have this let's talk about hyperplasia which it was called in 2004 by Jonathan Epstein uh, the U pump was introduced by Victor Wright and nobody really was very happy about it although he was completely right in his thinking um, the GAPS recommends to call it a typical urothelial pro proliferation flat or tented so if you have this kind of small undulations without any fi fibrovascular core you can call it tented AUP tented I think it's a very good uh, solution. Great. Uh, are there any more questions? We have another minute or two, and then we'll get uh, moving uh, with Dr. Verne. Uh, if not, uh, I'm going to, uh, again, thank Dr. Kamparat and Dr. Hess before her. And now we're going to move on to the third part of this. And we will have a couple minutes for questions in all these realms at the end as our timing is looking. Uh, so feel free to keep uh, keep putting uh, through the questions. Uh, Dr. Daniel Burney is professor of geopathology at Queen Mary University, London, and a consultant at what's called St. Bartholomew's. He calls it the Barts and the Royal London Hospitals. Uh, his focus has been in endocrine and geopathology with research in testicular neoplasia, carcinomas of the prostate and penis, and adrenal diseases. Um, he has also, like his colleagues, been involved in all recent geopathology efforts over the past decade and a half. Uh, he holds the title of editor-in-chief of Histo pathology for the past couple of years and for the fifth edition of the WHO was one of the editors specifically focused in the area of testicular neoplasia. And so without further ado, uh, an update on testicular pathology from the WHO 2022. Dan. Thank you, Samson. Um, the, uh, I, it's great to have so many people online, especially old friends I can see in the chat. Um, someone on Twitter has just described me as looking like a Bond villain, for which I apologize. Uh, but anyway, on to WHO 2022. Um, I think most of the major changes we did make were, were at this meeting in 2015. And that most of the changes that we've instituted in 2022 have really been fine tailoring a few things and minor issues. So following the radical uh, changes in 2015-16, in this is, is relatively minor, but there are some important things I want to point out. That was the uh, last editors, this time greatly assisted uh, and shared the work with uh, Satish Tiku and Maria Raz Polini, and fantastic people to work with. So what are the changes? First of all, it's a much more hierarchical classification here. And, and because of that, we had to change some of the, the, the uh, way things were done. For instance, variants could refer only to genetic changes. What was a subtype? What was a pattern? A changes in a few definitions. There's a couple of new entities. I'm hoping it's going to be a more user-friendly version with a lot of nice tables for um, immunochemistry use. And of course, as ever said, soft tissue inherited diseases, neuroendocrine is largely separate, though there is a little overlap there, as you'll see. So this is the basically unchanged uh, germ cell tumors derived from GCNIS, um, as we've continued to call it. Um, the non-invasive forms, not much change. GCNIS, um, gonadoblastoma we've put in here as well. Um, and there are specific rarer forms, but this is all uh, no change. I wish to just quickly mention gonadoblastoma because these tumors are often described as mixed germ cells, sex called stromal tumors. They are to me pre-neoplastic with Sertoli cells or immature uh, sex cord cells as the supporting cells. So I think they're just one type of neoplasia, but we'll go on and discuss this further. They are um, important uh, because uh, they are associated with um, a Y chromosome and disorders of sexual development. And there is a very, very high um, incidence of uh, progression to invasive germ cell neoplasia. So if you have someone with a gonadoblastoma, then if one gonad comes out, so does the other have to. Um, nomenclature. Um, I sort of have a great plan that, to unify germ cell tumors across the human body. And we have three names here for basically the same tumor. Um, I'm not sure whether we're ever actually going to agree on a name throughout the human body, but I have called this the germinoma family of tumors, of which seminoma um, is obviously um, the only real example. Um, Seminoma, again, comes in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Here's a very tubular uh, looking seminoma with apoptotic dropout. Uh, the only, that's a pattern. 
Uh, the only subtype we've kept, we've kept as a subtype, uh, a seminoma with syncytiotrophoblastic cells. Um, I always include this slide in, in my lecture because some people they call these choriocarcinomas mistakenly. They have a lower rise in beta HCG. So these are staying where they are as a subtype more to draw attention to them really than for any specific different behavioral, uh, uh, any behavior in them. So that's very quickly on seminomas. Non-seminomas also uh, basically unchanged. We've had to include all the trophoblastic tumors in this list because we can't put them as a subtype in this strict hierarchical classification. But basically you can see uh, no big changes there. Um, I want to go straight to one of our issues, which is teratoma with somatic type malignancy. Um, on the left, you can see an embryonal carcinoma. And on the right, you can see what was previously, as you'll see, called a primitive neuroectodermal tumor, uh, which, some, which is a common transformation in these tumors. Um, one problem we had was the criteria for somatic transformation. Now, somatic transformation is mostly diagnosed in metastases, but occasionally it does occur in the primary test, as I'm working on a series of that at the moment. They're different situations, but called the same thing. And as we know, in the metastatic situation, somatic transformation tends to have a dismal prognosis. And it's been defined previously as um, based on a low power field size, the size of the somatic transformation. This is a problem because in the WHO fifth edition, we're moving away from field diameters to be more consistent in that mitotic counts and anything based on field diameter um, varies too much to be reproducible and needs to be translated into millimeters or millimeters squared. And looking through the test, this literature, um, as I have done looking at this, there is really very little on what field diameters we use when low power or high power fields are being used, which is an issue uh, prospectively. So we have changed the definition of teratomosomatic transformation. Previously, it was a nodule of malignant cells equivalent to an area seen by a four times objective and overgrown other germ cell elements. We've translated this to a five millimeter nodule. I actually think this is an absolute minimum, especially in the testis. And we need to do more prospective work on this. And as I said, there is a difference with primary tumors with somatic transformation that do better than the secondary post chemotherapy ones. So I've, we've changed that uh, definition uh, to hopefully be more reproducible. The second problem we had uh, in um, somatic transformation was the issue of this entity, uh, PNET, of which you've got here a number of different patterns. PNET, as you know, is a common element in post-pubertal teratomas, but occasionally overgrowths become a dominant neoplasm. And the problem was this. I'm delighted that uh, Professor Hirsch is online. We had a, quite a few discussions about this. Um, the problem is that uh, PNET as an entity is, was replaced five, six years ago in WHO CNS by another tumour called embryonal tumour with multilayered rosettes. Um, also, PNET is not a synonym for Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma is a specific entity with an ESWR1 fly1 fusion. And these tumours um, in the testis or this differentiation element in the testis does not um, does not behave like a Ewing sarcoma and was the cause of some uh, oncologists giving the wrong treatment. And uh, the new AFIP volume in the WHO have coordinated really nicely on this to agree on a new terminology so that PNAT doesn't only exist in this entity. This, we have the same similar problem in the gynae tract with immature and neuroepithelium that I haven't really got time to go into here, but the change has been agreed is to embryonal neuroectodermal tumor and take out the primitive. So from now on, we're hoping to we'll call this embryonic neuroectodermal tumor and not uh, PNET. So going on to germ cell tumors unrelated to GCIS, this is always a more complex and vexed issues. The list here remains slightly enhanced by a new entity I want to talk about, prepubertal type testicular neuroendocrine tumor, but we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, the first thing we have to think about, there's lots more evidence now for the existence of um, what we call prepubertal type teratomas, benign teratomas of the postpubertal testis. Uh, this was a paper I was on quite a few years ago that informed the previous edition of the WHO. 
these tumours occur nearly always in the paediatric age group, but not always. They can occur in adults and they're much more akin to a dermoid cyst uh, that you get in the ovary than uh, the typical uh, post-pubertal type teratoma, which is of course perfectly capable of metastasis. This is a lovely example as it's got hair in, as you'd expect in an ovarian uh, dermoid cyst. And uh, we recently uh, published on this and uh, this basically is a, it's done, it remains a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to exclude a post-pubertal teratoma. There's no GCNAS, there's no atrophy, there's no immaturity in the often as an ENT. Um, and isochromosome 12P is negative. We also showed a strong association with uh, a neuroendocrine tumors with low grade nets. And you sometimes get nets on their own in the testis. Um, and you sometimes get them in association with prepubertal type uh, teratomas. And I think there's um, evidence that these tumors are much more likely to arise in the prepubertal teratomas type teratoma situation than in the postpubertal. Not always, but nearly always. Here's some example of a very well-defined sebaceous unit in a prepubertal type teratoma. You can get cartilage in these as well. And as I said, We've added these entities for pure neuroendocrine tumors. The other thing to say is that previously the word carcinoid was used. To my mind and many others, carcinoid is now an outdated term. And we need to talk about neuroendocrine tumors and the level of the differentiation. So most of these tumors arise in prepubertal type teratomas and are not GCIS related. So we've added these to the entity. Here's some um, examples. You've got these ones here, which have these little neuro low grade neuroendocrine nests associated with these uh, cysts here as part of the, the um, teratoma. And on the left, this was one that was a pure uh, net with again, no GCNS in the background. Uh, these neuroendocrine tumors, I think we just have to do what we'd normally do with a neuroendocrine tumor. We uh, look at the mitotic rate, we um, take the key 67, and most of them appear to, to do very well indeed. Uh, the occasional ones metastasize if they're higher grade, you can't be entirely predictable about it, but I think they're better placed here with the prepubertal teratomas, as I said, because of their close association. So that's all I want to say about the endocrine tumors, we, 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 about the uh, germ cell tumors. We now move on to the sex cord stromal tumors where we have introduced a few uh, new entities, though, as you can see from this list, it's largely um, unchanged. Um, what are the issues here? Uh, the issues for me still are the heterogeneous nature of Sertoli cell tumours. Uh, a wise pathologist, Gregor Mickles, once said he'd seen hundreds of Sertoli cell tumours, but he'd never seen one that looked like another one. There's a great degree of heterogeneity here. Uh, and I don't think we've entirely solved that. I've Unusually for a testicular pathologist, I have taken the lumping option here and I've lumped them all together. Um, other uh, groups might wish to split them slightly more off. Certainly we've uh, kept sclerosing Sertoli cell tumor in with Sertoli cell tumor NOS. We haven't differentiated them. These to my mind are just patterns of Sertoli cell tumor. There's a couple of new entities um, I want to mention to you. And again, we have a difficulty with criteria for malignancy and mitotic counts again. Um, the problem with this is that the question is, when does a sex called stromal tumor become high grade? This uh, paper um, from the Indiana group suggested that it was greater than five mitotic figures per 10 high power fields with a 40 times objective. That's fair enough. And it was good for the time, but nowadays we need to be thinking about uh, measuring mitoses per millimeter squared to, be, to, to de increase standardization between different users. Um, and the thing about this is if you do have a high grade, uh, a, a, a uh, high risk Sertoli or Leydig cell tumor, one might consider doing a prophylactic retroperitoneal lymph node dissection prophylactically, even if the nodes are negative. It's speculative, but the problem with these sex called stromal tumors is once they metastasize, it's extremely bad news. And that chemotherapy and radiotherapy do not seem to have a great deal of traction against them. So this is why we want further standardization here to try and work out which ones are going to do bad and which ones are going to do good. Do we need to follow up every Leydig and Sertoli cell tumor of 
one of uh, five or six millimeters? Probably not. So there's a lot of over uh, treatment that goes on in the low ones where people might get too many serial CTs and too much follow up. So we need to better define this low risk, high risk uh, that in, in future. Though I agree with the problem we have here is of course the rarity of the lesions. Uh, the second problem is a few new entities that have come up. Um, this is a slightly controversial entity, the signet ring stromal tumor. These signet ring cells do show morphological similarities to ovarian, and some have suggested solid pseudopapillary neoplasia of the pancreas. Others suggest it's just a pattern of Sertoli cell tumor. Um, I think we've added this primarily because it's so distinctive and looking signet ring, and it might confuse some uh, authors to believe it's, it's a metastasis. Um, in fact, I, I recently had a case uh, a few weeks ago where someone suggested metastasis, so it does occur. Um, it's, it's immunochemistry, it's bimentin, nuclear beta-catenin positive, that's an important one, cyclin D1, um, and synaptophysin, but it's negative for some of the other markers that are typical for um, sex cord stromal tumors, inhibin, calretinin, etc. And the potential, of course, is a confusion with signet ring carcinomas when they appear entirely benign. And this is an example of one, and you can see it's got a classic signet ring uh, morphology with a nucleus pushed to the side. Um, usually it'll be a small to medium sized thing in the testis. Um, so this is something, a new entity we've added uh, to be aware of. The second new entity we've added is a myoid gonadal stromal tumor. This was an emerging entity in the last classification. This is a spindle cell tumor that shows myoid type differentiation. Now it suggests that it, it's derived from the intertubular primitive mesenchymal cells. We really don't know. It's a tumor that goes in adults. You get short fascicles of spindle tumors with little atypia and it's positivity. Uh, it got, shows strong positivity for actin, S100, desmin and not for the other sex called stromal markers. It's distinguished from fibroma and fibrofleacoma by negativity for SOX9 and the absence of collagen bundles, and it's benign. Is it prognostically important? Probably not, but it's just another unusual immunochemical pattern we've managed to separate off. I think there's a lot of further work to go in the sex called stromal tumors to try and understand uh, what's a different entity, what isn't, and how they behave. So this is really an um, emerging area, I think, for the next few years. Here's an example of one. You've got these short fascicles. It is infiltrating. You can see the seminiferous tubules around it, but exceptionally bland. No mitoses, no atypia, and no necrosis. As I said, the criteria for malignancy in sex cause stromal is difficult. Mitotic counts per millimeter squared, please, in prospective series. And I've certainly started to do that. We'll work on that retrospectively as well to try and bring everything into place. Mea culpa. I've been doing it as well. Um, and very intriguing entity exists that we didn't put in the WHO classification, but we have mentioned it. It's been uh, promulgated by a number of authors um, and it is a mixed germ cell sex cord stromal tumor, which is not a gonadoblastoma. Now, an intriguing paper from two years ago in Verkaya's archives by Mikhailova et al. Uh, of eight cases with invasion into soft tissue. Um, granulosa cell elements were these sex called stromal elements, but the germ cell element was in fact OP4 negative, but very, very similar to spermatocytic tumor, which is astonishing. I've never seen anything like this. Um, other people strongly disagree with me. I still feel counterintuitively that this tumor cannot be a mixed tumor of sex cord stromal and germ cell elements. They're just too different in their der embryological derivation. And that I feel this is a collision tumor of some sort, very, very unusual findings, but I, I'm unable to convince myself that this is a true entity rather than some form of collision tumor. I'm open to hearing evidence on the other side, and but as I said, we've mentioned it, but haven't put it in the WHO uh, classification this time round. 
Uh, this is the sort of example of the sort of sex mixed sex called stromal germ cell tumor that I see, which is this uh, typical dark sex cord, maybe granulosa type pattern with these small studded germ cells throughout it. And I think this is a invasion of this sex cord stromal very, very slowly. This was from a very slowly growing tumor in a, in a lung undergraduate in, 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 um, um, in, in the UK. And I think these are little uh, invasive benign uh, germ cell rests that uh, remain as the sex cord stromal tumor advances. But I have a few examples of this. Um, but as I said, I don't think the two can be neoplastic working in the same way. And finally, onto the testicular adenexy. Um, so a variant of epithelial tumors, tumors of collecting duct rooted testis, paratesticular mesothelial tumors, and epithelial tumors of the epididymis. I'm obviously not going to go through the entire list of adenexal tumors or will uh, be here all night. But I did want to mention a change we've made in the mesothelial tumors. We have, I think, simplified and clarified a couple of issues. So we have the benign form, the adenomatoid tumor, which I'm sure you all seem all familiar with, the malignant mesothelioma of the tunica vaginalis at the bottom of the list, you'll probably equally know about, but you'll be lucky to have seen one. And then in between, um, this was previously called a, a subtype of mesothelioma, but we've separated it out into well-differentiated papillary mesothelial tumor based on its, its latching. This is a typical adenomatoid tumor, as you see with these little needle cytoplasm spikes uh, between these uh, thinned out attenuated glands, very typical. Um, malignant mesothelioma, again, you, I hope you, you know about, but it's a rare entity where you get this sort of hugely thickened papillary tumor surrounding the testis. And here's a nice example of one. It's usually epithelioid, rare, rarely sarcomatoid. And finally, this new entity we're calling well-differentiated papillary mesothelium, mesothelial tumor. We're no longer calling it benign. Um, and the thing to do with this tumor, if you see this pattern, is to make sure you thoroughly sample and exclude invasive areas. Because as soon as you see invasive areas, it becomes a mesothelioma by default because it's invasive. But these papillary tumors do have a very good prognosis and probably can don't need adjuvant therapy and just uh, good excision. Um, so uh, this is a restructuring rather than a radical revision of the mesothelial part of the adenexal tumor section. Uh, here's another example here. Again, you've got these uh, uh, thinned uh, cuboid mesothelial cells like you have at the tunic of vaginalis, but lining a papillary forms with no true invasion. Um, and virtually finally, uh, we have sertoliform cystadenoma. Now, this is um, an interesting story where I've, I've again, uh, with agreement of everyone else, agreed that we can abolish an entity, which is very rare in the testis, rather than creating one. Um, so totally cystadenoma is basically uh, these cells that arise in the reti testis and distort the reti. And um, they're obviously astonishingly rare entity. Uh, but their immunochemistry is essentially identical to Sertoli cell tumors. And my feeling is that this is a variant of Sertoli cell tumor that is just have an unusual pattern invading the reti testis. And I'll be willing to convince if someone should be molecular changes or a radically different immunochemistry that this was different. But at the moment, I don't think this is the case. So I, I and others have shoved this back in the Sertoli cell category. They're entirely benign, so obviously its relevance is not great, though it's an, they're astonishingly patterned tumors uh, when you see them. So work in progress for testis is the following. I think we have to work carefully on mitotic rates per millimeter squared, especially in sex called stromal tumors. Uh, we have to work on the criteria for somatic transformation. I do think somatic transformation uh, is a mixed bag of primaries and secondary tumors. Um, and it's certainly in my consult practice, I quite get quite a few cases of people saying, is this a somatic transformation when it isn't? Um, and also I have to add in here the criteria for adjuvant treatment. This is likely to be work on staging criteria, which I really 
uh, won't talk about today as we did with WHO. But the criteria for adjuvant treatment on a primary stage one germ cell tumor is still controversial. And this is something that we need to prospectively work on. As I said, sex cord stromal tumors are still to my mind confusing to everyone. We need to work out better on what is a high risk and low risk tumor. Um, etiology and pathogenesis for some of these areas is something, still something we can um, all work on. It's still not fully understood, especially in these so-called uh, mixed tumors that I've described between germ cell and sex cord stromal tumors um, and in some of the adenexal tumors. And finally, my big wish is that we're all speaking the same language. Um, the ovarian community uh, have a very different way of talking about germ cell tumors with dysgerminomas, with, um, uh, with um, immature teratomas. Um, and I would like some uniform consistency between the different uh, organs independent of organ. This has been tried by some people, um, and notably the Rotterdam group. Um, I think I saw Arno van Linders online earlier on. Uh, so they had type one tube, type six of ovarian tumors, but the typing is not very, uh, uh, not very user friendly really, and hasn't caught on ter terribly. I think we have much more descriptors to use rather than types to make it useful for general pathologists. So that's a great wish for the future. And at that point, I wish to say goodbye testicles. Thank you very much, Samson and Guts, for inviting me to speak. Um, if you want to look up more on testis tumors at Daniel underscore Bernie, and I can't resist a plug for, of course, um, the best uh, pathology journal, which is, of course, histopathology at histo underscore journal. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dan. And uh, of course, to Andra and Ava as well. I've uh, I've got a bunch of questions here. Uh, first three for Dan, and then we're going to open it up because people are fortunately, we have a couple minutes and uh, people are asking questions for everyone. Uh, Dan, I've noted three specific questions for you. The first, I think, is fairly straightforward, but I'll let you have a go at it. In an RPLND for non-seminoma, in other words, for mixed germ cell tumor post-chemo, should people be noting small elements of immaturity or or is it still not necessary to uh, separate mature and immature elements of teratoma in that setting? No, there's good evidence that in small amounts of immaturity don't matter. I don't think anyone could decide what in cartilage, for instance, is immature and mature. I think we, we waste our time on that. Occasionally you get the odd difficult case, uh, which shows, you know, th the problem is the other end of the scale when it goes from immaturity towards somatic transformation. I think these low amounts of maturity really don't matter. Okay, a second question was why uh, ENT and not PNET? Because primitive is used in no other part of the human body and it's just not used. And by keeping it broad, embryonal neuroectodermal, I must say, if you can get it in the MJ surge path, um, um, Michelle, uh, Dr. Albright and Dr. Flood have written a superb um, overview of this and we talk about it quite extensively in the WHO but they've written a very great paper explaining exactly why this for both gynecological and testicular tumor this is a great idea. Okay and finally specifically with regard to the testes that's come in uh, your thoughts on quantitative key 67 in sex cord stromal tumors. That's a great question. Um, I think it's helpful. Um, I must say I do it. Uh, but I think the evidence base is not there yet because there's just not enough of the tumors about. But I do it, but my evidence base for it is frankly not poor, not, not, not great. So um, I, I think it can help though. Okay, so I'm going to throw a question to Ava's way. There was a recurring question in both the QA and the chat on the best biomarkers for establishing urethial carcinoma origin is coming from the bladder. Uh, maybe you want to unmute. Sorry. Yeah, well, um, as I told you, I'm not a very big fan of, of all these kind of immunochemistries. The second thing is we have a problem with the cutoffs. Where do you put your cutoffs? And you all know you, you can have tumors which express a little bit everything, basal, luminal, whatever. So it's not a very good idea, I think, to do this kind of stuff. Excellent. At the moment. Thank you. Dr. Hess, 
uh, you know, a, a lot of back and forth. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Hess moderating the chat as the Dr. Kamvarat as we were going uh, along. But I think it's worth uh, saying out loud uh, the question of our colleague, uh, Dr. Van Leenders, uh, will type one and two be still recommended for papillary yeah. renal cell carcinoma? I think it's important to state this. I already tried to answer that, but, but it's even more complicated. But I, I think that everybody uh, agree that the type one, so-called classic papillary RCC is very well defined and nobody have a problem with that. Uh, the problem is with so-called type two because apparently this is a group of the tumors. So, so actually as the WHO will recommend or recommends that, that we will just say papillary RCC and we can, we can add some notice that this is this type or subtype and what, what is the meaning for the clinicians, but there is a no official subclassification which is I think wise in the, at the moment, because we have to collect the data, we have to collect the evidence, and then it will be reason for some, I don't know, some meeting or something, some, 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 some shared knowledge to, 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 up to, to have some approach how to, how to handle this. But I think actually we do not have enough of evidence for any official subtyping. Excellent. Lots of thanks for the excellent talks coming in. Two specific questions for Dan here regarding immunostochemistry, uh, sort of A and a B. Uh, any uh, other markers coming down the pike other than AFP and glypecan 3 for yolk sac tumor? And in a related fashion, uh, the experience with IHC and germ cell tumors in RPL and D specimens post chemo. Okay. Um... I have to be pushed to introduce new immunochemistry, I must say. I, 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 it takes a lot for me to change my ways. I've seen so many times brand new marker comes on the line, it's better, and, and it, it very rarely is. I'm still scarred by smoothling in the bladder from about 15 years ago, which, which came in and then, then went out again. Um, so I don't think, I think Glipican and AFP, and let's face it, knowledge of the serum markers is perfectly adequate to diagnose. Um, the, um, the second question was on RPLNDs. It can be more difficult in RPLNDs. I wrote a paper quite a while ago showing that you can get CD30 loss in embryonal carcinoma um, in uh, um, metastatic germ cell tumors. I think a lot of that has been overcome. We, we didn't have OC4 at that time, which is much more helpful. Uh, so uh, the immunochemistry can be more difficult. RPLNDs can, if you went on the RPLNDs, 90% are mature teratoma or teratoma and easy. There's just a five to 10% that are an absolute nightmare to do and occasionally really, really difficult. Excellent, thank you so much. Dr. Hess, with regard to uh, all of our different uh, papillary renal cell carcinoma uh, varieties, some that, some that have come up specifically, biphasic squamoalveolar, oncocytic papillary or, or reverse polarity uh, papillary tumors. As a top line diagnosis, a recommendation, papillary or something more specific and descriptive? What would you do at the current time? Again, in the current time, I, I, I just try to, to, to recognize that it's papillary at the first. And if I'm able to make some, some more refining, uh, I, I add this notice to the clinical report. But I always write that this is not official entity, that the clinical meaning is that or that. It's more benign, more malignant, more aggressive. And that's it. So I, again, I don't like to make some su super official uh, subtyping of the papillary RCC. Uh, of course, if you, if you read the literature, you see that some of them are, are somehow more connected to each to other. I mean, for example, the squamoid is very close to the papillary classic type one, it's obvious, but in others, we don't know. We don't know, we don't have evidence. So it's too early to have some, some, some specific comments for those sub entities, variants, however we want to call it. Excellent. And I'll ask as maybe a last question to all three of you, um, you know, in each of the uh, in each of the realms, whether it's kidney, whether it's urethelial, whether it's uh, in the testis, um, there are elements where it, it would be possible or not possible to include a percentage of a various component. Ava mentioned this uh, with regard to uh, urethelial and, and subtypes. Uh, Obviously, this is something that uh, some practice in germ cell tumors, how, uh, other than a case-by-case -case circumstance uh, where uh, clinical meaning needs to be assessed, let's say, for instance, in germ cell tumors, uh, is there a necessity uh, based in, in, in the who's thinking of giving a percentage of different components in primary tumors? Dan and what others have heard and are doing. I, I think there definitely is. The reason being for a stage one 
localized tumor, it may affect whether adjuvant treatment is given or not. If you have a uh, non seminematous tumor with 90% embryonal carcinoma, it's had a much higher risk of recurrence than a, a than a non, a non seminoma with 10%, 5% embryonal carcinoma. There are different ways you can quantify it. I just use a ballpark figure and, uh, and, and add it up. I don't uh, measure every single element of the tumor in a very, very precise way. Uh, but I do think on a ballpark figure, it can really affect whether adjuvant is given or not. Excellent. And one final question is, can we differentiate sarcomatide yolk sac tumor post chemotherapy from teratoma? Uh -huh. Maybe we can just get, since we have one minute left, uh, a yes or no and, uh, and go over to other, uh, to other sessions with this. Only with great difficulty, but uh, if you're talking about a, a, a sarcoma, but it really doesn't matter. As you know, sarcomatoid yolk sac and sarcomas do equally poorly, really. So I'd love to thank you for that answer and thank Dr. Hess and Dr. Kamparat and Dr. Bernie for joining us on this first uh, GUPS virtual education uh, series event. Uh, as you said, uh, if you are currently a GUPS member or would like to uh, join us as a GUPS member, uh, which I believe is also free for trainees and uh, we see some trainees on with us today, um, we uh, are very pleased to uh, have you and provide you with updates uh, in the future. Um, we're going to end the session now to keep on time, um, but again, thank you to our speakers uh, for the wonderful uh, presentations and wonderful question and answer session. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank bye you bye. very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh. They've gone. Are we off, Samson? Bye. Bye.